Hi, thanks for tuning in to this session on real-time analytics from video and image data. My name is Jimmy O'Donnell, and I'm a data scientist in Esri's Professional Services Division. My goal for this presentation is to help you become a little more familiar with the benefits, capabilities, and requirements of deep learning for integrating image and video data into your geospatial workflows. I'll focus specifically on some real-time and near real-time applications. By the end of this presentation, I hope you'll have a better general understanding of deep learning, some ideas of business problems your organization might be able to address with this approach, and knowledge of the requirements to implement such a solution. Let's get started. First, I'd like to point out that while many of you might be very familiar with using orthorectified imagery layers in GIS, I will be focusing on less traditional data sources. Esri provides tools to achieve lots of cool things with that kind of image data, but they won't be my focus during this presentation. Second, remember that video can be thought of as an ordered sequence of images. At some points, I might refer to one or the other but the same concepts apply to both. Let's talk about the raw data. Images by themselves are nice to look at, and as humans, we can quickly extract useful information from them. For example, our brains are able to quickly gather that this image contains cars, buildings, and trees. We could go even further, and because those are coconut palms, guess that we are probably near the tropics. There's a huge amount of potential information in each image. The trick is being able to extract it efficiently. Images are quick and relatively inexpensive to collect, and they're relatively standardized. We can find objects and images taken 100 years ago and can easily accommodate images from different cameras. Making use of images and videos can be challenging image data can be quite large. A color image contains a lot of data. A number represents the intensity of each of three color channels at every pixel, red, green, and blue. For a single 1080 by 1920 pixel image, that's over six million numbers to keep track of. We're used to hearing about those types of numbers, which is just six megabytes after all, but remember that each of those needs to be processed by whatever analytical tool we're running to extract useful data from that image. That's a computationally intensive task. Additionally, for a computer to learn to perform this task automatically, it will need to have seen some examples. That is, we need to provide the ground truth against which we'd like to evaluate the model's performance. For example, if we want the computer to give us the locations of every car in an image, we'll have to provide it with the locations of every car in a set of images. For tasks that are more nuanced than find the cars, we might need to provide a large number of these examples. Assembling such a data set can take a lot of person hours to generate. Taken together, the cost of storage and processing of this data can add up quickly. Now that you've gotten an appreciation for the raw data we're working with, let's talk about how we turn that into useful information by teaching a computer to extract the information that's of interest to us. We call this machine learning. I want to spend a few minutes on the basics of machine learning to make sure we're on the same page. I won't pretend this is a thorough intro to machine learning, but rather defining some of the terminology that is critical to understand for any stakeholder in a machine learning engagement. A machine learning model is simply a function that takes some input data, performs some mathematical operations on it, and outputs some other value. You could also think of this as a program or equation. A useful model is one whose output matches what we consider to be the correct answer. One way you could think of this is like a machine 
with a bunch of dials, knobs, and buttons. Some combinations of values for each of these dials will yield better answers than other combinations. In machine learning land, we call these dials parameters. The process of finding the best values, or weights, for the parameters of our model is called training. As I mentioned earlier, in order for the model to know whether its output is good or bad, we need to give it some examples as a ground truth. These ground truth examples are commonly referred to as labels. The labels need to reflect exactly the type of output we want to get from the model automatically. So, considering the case where our raw data is an image, if we want a model to apply a category to an entire image, the labels are just the category, for instance, a single word. We call this classification. If we want a model to find the location of each instance of an object, the labels must be the location of each instance of the objects in the image. For instance, the coordinates of the bounding boxes encapsulating the objects. We call this object detection. Finally, if we want a model to determine which type of object is represented by each and every pixel in an image, the labels must be the category of every pixel. In this case, the label itself is also an image. We call this segmentation. Once we have a trained model, the process of using that model to make predictions on new data without human input is usually referred to as inference and is also usually less computationally intensive than the training process itself. Broadly, we use the term computer vision to refer to automated extraction of more useful data from images. Most computer vision applications rely on machine learning, and the most effective type of machine learning models for computer vision are deep neural networks hence the term deep learning. At its core, deep learning is no different from any other machine learning approach. The aspects of deep learning that are of relevance, though, are that under the hood, there are a lot of parameters. That is, it's a machine with a lot of dials, to use our earlier example. And those parameters are arranged in such a way that data gets passed back and forth between them many times. It's precisely this complexity that makes them both very good at the task and very computationally intensive to train. This computational intensity can require specialized hardware like GPUs, which can be costly. Before I get into some specific examples, I want to mention some points about incorporating these tools in real-time workflows. Processing image data is computationally intense. Processing image data quickly can be really challenging. These challenges aren't insurmountable, but it can certainly add complexity and cost to the solution. It's generally hard to find solutions that satisfy all three conditions of the good, fast, or cheap trilemma. Before pursuing real-time approaches, I'd encourage you to consider your specific needs. Ask yourself, what decisions could the output allow me to make? And what is the cost of a delay in that information? It could be that alerts allow you to take action to avoid missing out on revenue. Or perhaps automated notifications of car accidents could result in faster response times, reducing the likelihood of more serious injuries or death. Balancing these needs warrants some careful consideration. Okay, 
Now I'll give an overview of three real-world use cases which rely on different combinations of the following. The type of raw data, that is image versus video. The turnaround speed, real-time, near real-time, or batch processing. And finally, the source of the image data. I'll talk about data from vehicle-mounted dash cams, stationary cameras that monitor a single area around the clock, and drones. The first use case is an ongoing project we're working on with the Iowa Department of Transportation. Iowa DOT is responsible for thousands and thousands of miles of roads. They have a sizable budget for winter road maintenance tasks, such as salting and plowing, in order to prevent accidents. They collect and report data on the road conditions around the state during the winter, that is, whether the roads are passable or covered by snow. And this data is maintained and reported as part of a well-organized system that allows the public to access and view the data in convenient ways. Additionally, their fleet of approximately 700 snowplows are equipped with dash cams that take pictures of the roadway at regular intervals and upload them to the cloud. These are linked to the same public-facing system. I encourage you to check that out at these links. Travelers can prepare for a trip by checking the map of conditions for each segment or confirm conditions by viewing recent photos from their planned route. The track a plow feature is especially popular because motorists can make a judgment about road conditions based on very recent photos that cover a greater area than would be possible with cameras mounted in stationary locations. Our goal was to explore the efficacy of computer vision to enhance the accuracy, timeliness, and overall user experience. We wanted to automate the task of assessing road conditions from these images. For each image, we wanted an automated assessment of whether the roadway ahead was dry, wet, partially snow-covered, or completely snow-covered. If this were an in-person presentation, I'd use this opportunity to quiz the room on which type of computer vision task we're working on here, classification, object detection, or segmentation. Kudos if you guessed classification. Here's how we approached this problem. Iowa DOT employees labeled approximately 10,000 images with the road conditions they represent. We then trained a deep learning model on this data set using an internal machine and professional services with a high performance GPU. We found the model's performance to be sufficient to justify moving forward with deployment. Once the model was trained, we deployed it on a machine in the Iowa DOT offices. We scheduled a script to run every five minutes that does the following tasks. Checks the database for new images, pulls any new images from their storage in the cloud, and runs them through the model to infer the road conditions. It then writes these conditions to a table that is written to an ArcGIS Online hosted feature service. While this machine at the DOT has a GPU, we found that even during winter storms, when many plows are on the roads uplo uploading images, the model is able to keep up. This isn't real time, but the decisions that this data could influence do not need to occur in real time. By allowing for a five minute delay, we kept the system a little simpler and easier to maintain. We're still learning exactly which features will be important to making the system as useful as it can be to both the DOT and the public. The Iowa DOT has some really smart folks on their end, and I'm excited to see what direction they take this project next. Next, I'll talk about a project we've worked on with one of our most advanced users in the retail industry. This customer wanted to better understand how their parking lots were utilized and how they could improve that experience for their customers. 
they wanted to use what they learned from this to make changes to existing locations, as well as helping plan new locations. In order to capture a complete view of the action, they recorded video from drones flying overhead at their real retail locations. Analysts then review the videos to watch for repeated patterns and behaviors. But realizing the broader opportunities of this data, they engaged with us to try to make that process easier and more repeatable for the analysts. In this case, we needed to automatically extract the positions of each vehicle in each frame of video. However, remember that they specifically want to know more about each driver's experience. If we use simple object detection, that is locating the position of each object of interest, we just have a different data set for each frame of the video. What we needed was to know where each car had moved from one frame to the next. This is known as object detection and tracking. We trained our models on both publicly available data sets and custom labeled data. This model outputs a straightforward table, which contains a unique ID for every vehicle from the video and its position in every frame. You'll note that there's no real-time component here because there isn't a real-time need. Videos come in from time to time, and whenever that happens, an analyst simply runs the new video through the model. The machine they're running this on is beefy, but not particularly specialized. But the process does require a GPU to finish in a reasonable amount of time, about twice the length of the raw video. Once the raw video is processed into a table that can be imported into ArcGIS Pro, the really interesting stuff can happen. There are a variety of analytical tools available to analyze these types of data, such as hotspot analyses. For this customer, we wrote a custom script to identify specific behaviors of interest. One limiting factor of the drone approach is that the batteries for these drones only last about 20 to 30 minutes. This means that you'll only capture the entire experience of customers who complete a transaction in less time than that. We're currently thinking about ways to get around this limitation while limiting the needs for our customers to invest in permanent hardware or any other major changes to their retail infrastructure. Finally, I'll talk about a project we're currently working on with the city of Raleigh, North Carolina. The city maintains an internal system of closed circuit cameras that allow for the easy monitoring of traffic conditions across the city from a single control room. Clearly, monitoring current traffic conditions is not all that the city is responsible for. They're a very forward-thinking organization that regularly conducts studies to help them understand how to better plan and accommodate the changing needs of its residents. For example, understanding the volume and patterns of traffic at a given intersection can help make decisions about how to plan new construction and routing. The city wanted to get additional value from their existing network of cameras, and one way of doing that is to automate the extraction of useful information from the feeds. With support from our partners at Dell and NVIDIA, we're currently helping the city build a system that extracts useful information from these camera streams with a focus on a count of the cars taking each possible trajectory through an intersection. You might recognize that this current task is not one that necessarily influences real-time decision-making. However, processing this data asynchronously would require we dump the video streams to files. That may be fine for some applications, but with hundreds of high-resolution cameras, storing that data quickly becomes cumbersome. At the same time, keeping up with real-time video means performing object detection on each frame of a video feed quickly enough to keep up with the video frame rate. No small feat. As if this isn't enough, we aren't just interested in the count of cars in each frame we need to track the identity of those objects from one frame to the next if we're going to monitor each different path. 
We took advantage of new software from NVIDIA called DeepStream, which is highly optimized to perform computer vision tasks about as quickly as possible on NVIDIA's powerful GPUs. Luckily, detecting cars and images is a relatively common computer vision task, and for now, we're getting satisfactory performance from a model that has already been trained on extensive data. However, as we refine the system and require a more accurate model or want to expand to tasks which are not so well established, NVIDIA has also developed the Transfer Learning Toolkit, which allows users to improve model performance with minimal additional labeled training data. We're developing our solution on a Dell R740 equipped with an NVIDIA Tesla T4 GPU. We configured DeepStream to read from the city's camera feeds and write its output to an Apache Kafka message broker. The city then leverages the real-time capabilities of GeoEvent server to grab messages from this broker and push the data to web apps, maps, and dashboards in ArcGIS Online. With this setup, the city of Raleigh will be able to monitor the volume and patterns of traffic at a huge number of intersections without any additional human intervention and with a throughput that far outstrips the capabilities of a human monitoring from a control room. By analyzing video streams in real time, the useful information is effectively skimmed from the streams, avoiding costly and cumbersome storage of large volumes of data. I'll very quickly sum up some of the requirements for successful engagement in this space. First, if you don't already have a trained model, you'll need labeled data. How much data? The bare minimum varies with the complexity of the task. However, a good baseline is a lot. Once you've got labeled data, you'll need to train a model. There are a number of good frameworks for model training, and several of these are available in ArcGIS Pro with the Image Analyst extension. In general, a GPU is a prerequisite for training deep learning models on images. Next, you'll need to decide how you want to run new data through your model. We have had excellent results using the open sourced Onyx runtime. Finally, you'll want to decide how you want to use the model output. This might be visualizations such as web apps and maps, either online or in pro, summary statistics such as counts or averages to be consumed by tools like GeoEvent Server and eventually in dashboards, or even more advanced downstream analytics such as clustering and anomaly detection. I hope I've demonstrated that machine learning and deep learning are not magic and that you shouldn't be intimidated by them. I hope you see these techniques and data sources as tools in your arsenal for solving difficult problems. And most importantly, I hope this has sparked some ideas for how you might incorporate these approaches into your geospatial workflow. I'm excited to hear how you imagine you could make use of these tools please don't hesitate to get in touch by email and we can set up some time to chat. Thanks for watching.